Conspiracy theorists believe modern history reflects a long-term conspiracy by an international financial elite to enslave humanity. Like blind men examining an elephant, we attribute this conspiracy to Jewish bankers, Illuminati, Vatican, Jesuits, Freemasons, Black Nobility, and Bilderbergs etc. The real villains are at the heart of our economic and cultural life. They are the dynastic families who own the Bank of England, the US Federal Reserve, and associated cartels. They also control the World Bank and IMF, and most of the world's intelligence agencies. Their identity is secret, but Rothschild is certainly one of them. The Bank of England was nationalized in 1946, but the power to create money remained in the same hands. England is in fact a financial oligarchy, run by the Crown, which refers to the City of London, not the Queen. The City of London is run by the Bank of England, a private corporation. The Square Mile City is a sovereign state, located in the heart of Greater London. As the Vatican of the financial world, the city is not subject to British law. On the contrary, the bankers dictate to the British Parliament. In 1886, Andrew Carnegie wrote that, six or seven men can plunge the nation into war without consulting Parliament at all. Vincent Vickers, a director of the Bank of England from 1910 to 1919 blamed the city for all the wars of the world. The British Empire was an extension of bankers' financial interests, Indeed, all the non-white colonies, such as India, Hong Kong, and Gibraltar, were crown colonies. They belonged to the city, and were not subject to British law, although Englishmen were expected to conquer and pay for their upkeep. The Bank of England assumed control of the US during the Theodore Roosevelt administration, 1901-1909, when its agent J.P. Morgan took over 25% of American business. Anton Chaitkin, Treason in America, 1964. Before I continue the video, please smash that like button for me. Thank you. According to the American Almanac, the bankers are part of a network, called the Club of the Isles, which is an informal association of predominantly European-based royal households, including the Queen. The Club of the Isles commands an estimated $10 trillion in assets. It controls such corporate giants as Royal Dutch Shell, Imperial Chemical Industries, Lloyds of London, Unilever, Lonro, Rio Tinto Zinc, and Anglo-American De Beers. It dominates the world supply of petroleum, gold, diamonds, and many other vital raw materials. These assets serve its geopolitical agenda. Its goal is to reduce the human population from over 7 billion people to below 1 billion people within the next two to three generations, to literally cull the human herd in the interest of retaining their own global power and the feudal system upon which it is based. Historian Jeffrey Steinberg could be referring to the US, Canada and Australia when he writes, England, Scotland, Wales, and, especially Northern Ireland, are today a little more than slave plantations and social engineering laboratories, serving the needs of, the City of London. These families constitute a financier oligarchy, they are the power behind the Windsor throne. They view themselves as the heirs to the Venetian oligarchy, which infiltrated and subverted England from the period 1509 to 1715, and established a new, more virulent Anglo-Dutch-Swiss strain of the oligarchic system of Imperial Babylon, Persia, Rome, and Byzantium. The City of London dominates the world's speculative markets. A tightly interlocking group of corporations, involved in raw materials extraction, finance, insurance, transportation, and food production, controls the lion's share of the world market and exerts virtual choke point control over world industry. Steinberg, who is associated with economist Lyndon LaRouche, has traced this scourge to the migration of the Venetian mercantile oligarchy to England more than 300 years ago. Although LaRouche historians do not say so, it appears that many members of this oligarchy were Jews. Cecil Roth writes. The trade of Venice was overwhelmingly concentrated in the hands of the Jews, the wealthiest of the mercantile class. As William Guy Carr points out in Pawns in the Game, both Oliver Cromwell and William of Orange were funded by Jewish bankers. The English Revolution, 1649, was the first in a series of revolutions designed to give them world hegemony. The establishment of the Bank of England by William in 1694 was the next crucial step. Behind the facade, England has been a Jewish state for over 300 years. 
the Jewish banking families made it a practice to marry their female offspring to spendthrift European aristocrats. In Jewish law, the mixed offspring of a Jewish mother is Jewish. For example, in 1878, Hannah Rothschild married Lord Rosebery who later became Prime Minister. The Maylayers marry Jews, although Victor and his son Jacob Rothschild are exceptions. They both married Gentiles. In 1922, Louis Mintbanton, the uncle of Prince Philip and cousin of the Queen, married the granddaughter of Jewish banker Ernest Castle, one of the wealthiest men in the world. Winston Churchill's mother, Jenny Jacobson Jerome, was Jewish. By the beginning of the 1900s, very few English aristocrat families hadn't intermarried with Jews. When they visited the continent, Europeans were surprised to see Jewish-looking persons with English titles and accents. According to L. G. Pine, the editor of Burke's Peerage, Jews have made themselves so closely connected with the British peerage that the two classes are unlikely to suffer loss which is not mutual. So closely linked are the Jews and the lords that a blow against the Jews in this country would not be possible without injuring the aristocracy also. If they aren't Jewish by intermarriage, many European aristocrats consider themselves descendants of biblical Hebrews. The Habsburgs are related by marriage to the Merovingians who claim to be descendants of the tribe of Benjamin. In addition, many aristocrats belong to the British Israel movement that believes the British sovereign is the head of the Anglo-Saxon lost tribes of Israel and that the apocalypse will see the full reconstitution of the British Empire. According to Barbara Aho, Rosicrucians and Freemasons, who believe in British Israelism, have a plan to place one of their bloodline on the throne of the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. This positioning of a false messiah whom the world will worship as Christ has been carefully planned and executed over many centuries. Barry Chamish writes, there would be no modern state of Israel without British Freemasonry. In the 1860s, the British Israelite movement was initiated from within Freemasonry. Its goal was to establish a Jewish Masonic state in the Turkish province of Palestine. Initially, British Jewish Masonic families like the Rothschilds and Montefiores provided the capital to build the infrastructure for the anticipated wave of immigration. However, luring the Jews to Israel was proving difficult. They liked European life too much to abandon it. So Europe was to be turned into a nightmare for the Jews. In conclusion, the Jewish-British elite's goal of world domination took the form of British and American imperialism and later Zionism and the New World Order. Let's begin by defining the New World Order. The mainspring of the New World Order is the desire of the world central bankers to translate their vast economic power into permanent global institutions of political and social control. Their power is based on their monopoly over credit. They use the government's credit to print money and require the taxpayer to fork over billions in interest to them. Central banks like the Federal Reserve pretend to be government institutions. They are not. They are privately owned by perhaps 300 families. It is significant that the majority of these families are Jewish or part Jewish. I am a non-observant Jew who believes this situation is lethal for humanity and Jews alike. The American inventor, Thomas Edison, described this colossal scam as follows. It is absurd to say, our country can issue bonds and cannot issue currency. Both are promises to pay, but one fattens the usurer, and the other helps the people. Central banks also control the supply of credit to businesses and individuals. Robert Hemphill, credit manager of the Federal Reserve Bank in Atlanta, described this untenable situation. This is a staggering thought. We are completely dependent on the commercial banks. Someone has to borrow every dollar we have in circulation, cash or credit. If the banks create ample synthetic money, we are prosperous, if not, we starve. We are absolutely without a permanent money system. When one gets a complete grasp of the picture, the tragic absurdity of our hopeless position is almost incredible, but there it is. It is so important that our present civilization may collapse, unless it becomes widely understood and the defects remedied very soon. In an infamous letter to New York agents in 1863, Rothschild banker, John Sherman, characterized their proposal for a national bank in these terms. The few who understand the system will either be so interested in its profits, or so dependent on its favors, that there will be no opposition from that class. The great body of the people, mentally incapable of comprehending, will bear its burden without complaint, and perhaps without even suspecting that the system is inimical, or contrary, to their interests. The New World Order is a hydra-headed monster. The bankers work through many fronts, such as communism, socialism, liberalism, feminism, Zionism, neoconservatism and Freemasonry. Unknown to most members, these progressive movements are all secretly devoted to world revolution, which is a euphemism for banker hegemony and Satanism. 
The bankers control the world's major corporations, media, intelligence agencies, think tanks, foundations and universities. They are responsible for suppressing the truth. Jews figure prominently in all of this, a cause of anti-Semitism. Of course, many other people are pursuing success as well. The bankers also work through countries. They are largely responsible for British and American imperialism, whose aim is to monopolize the world's wealth. In his book, The Jews, 1922, British social critic, Hilaire Belloc writes that the British Empire represented a partnership between Jewish finance and the British aristocracy. After Waterloo, 1815, London became the money market and the clearing house of the world. The interests of the Jew as a financial dealer and the interests of this great commercial polity approximated more and more. One may say that by the last third of the 19th century, they had become virtually identical. The confluence of Jewish and British interest extended to marriage. Marriages began to take place, wholesale, between what had once been the aristocratic territorial families of this country and the Jewish commercial fortunes. After two generations of this, with the opening of the 20th century, those of the great territorial English families in which there was no Jewish blood was the exception. In nearly all of them was the strain more or less marked, in some of them so strong, that though the name was still an English name, and the traditions those of a purely English lineage of the long past, the physique and character had become wholly Jewish. If the marriage of Al Gore's daughter with Jacob Schiff's grandson is any indication, this mingling of the Jewish and Gentile elite extends to America as well. The British and Jewish goal of world domination was synonymous and used Freemasonry as an instrument. Belloc writes, specifically Jewish institutions, such as Freemasonry, which the Jews had inaugurated as a sort of bridge between themselves and their hosts in the 17th century, were particularly strong in Britain, and there arose a political tradition, active, and ultimately to prove of great importance, whereby the British state was tacitly accepted by foreign governments as the official protector of the Jews in other countries. It was Britain which was expected to intervene wherever Jewish persecution took place and to support the Jewish financial energies throughout the world, and to receive in return the benefit of that connection. If Belloc is right, the New World Order is an extension of the British Empire, in which elite British, American and Jewish imperial interests are indistinguishable. The majority of Jews would want no part of the New World Order, aka globalization, if they understood its undemocratic character and how they are being used. The true Jewish spirit holds that truth and morality are absolute and cannot be trimmed to fit one's perceived self-interest. G. J. Neuberger expresses this spirit in his essay, The Great Gulf Between Zionism and Judaism. The Jewish people are chosen not for domination over others, not for conquest or warfare, but to serve G.D. and thus to serve mankind. Thus physical violence is not a tradition or a value of the Jews. The task for which the Jewish people were chosen is not to set an example of military superiority or technical achievements, but to seek perfection in moral behavior and spiritual purity. Of all the crimes of political Zionism, the worst and most basic, and which explains all its other misdeeds, is that. Zionism has sought to separate the Jewish people from their GD, to render the divine covenant null and void, and to substitute a modern statehood and fraudulent sovereignty for the lofty ideals of the Jewish people. The bankers obviously aren't concerned about true Judaism or racial purity, and were quite willing to sacrifice millions of Jews to achieve their design by creating Hitler. They are sacrificing thousands more Jewish, American and Muslim lives in the Middle East, in their Orwellian perpetual war for perpetual peace. Does the New World Order serve a Jewish racial agenda or a Kabbalistic banker elite agenda? I would venture that it serves the latter, an organized jury has been harnessed to this agenda, like so many other opportunistic or unwitting groups. By giving private individuals the ability to create money out of nothing, we have created a monster, which threatens to devour the earth, and with it the human race. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. All is appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. Thanks for watching this video. This everything inside me channel, see you on the next video. Stay safe and healthy.